Uh, I think uh, the big thing, of course, was with showbands and Waterford, was the Royal Showband came from Waterford, and that lifted uh, the, the tide for all boats, lifted on their tide. But th there's an awful lot of misinformation and misconceptions about the showband era. Um, I mean, there's a great body of people out there who thought they were all half Egypts, you know, who uh, couldn't play their instruments and, you know, went on with all sorts of paddy wackery. But that's, that's not true at all. And the time frame is often mixed up as well. Um, the show band era really began in the late 1950s. I mean, I was a small boy in short trousers going to school uh, when the Royal Showband uh, were the most famous uh, dance band in Ireland and Britain. They won the Carl Allen Award in the late 50s, I think. But uh, I remember there was <coughs> there was three of them from Ferrybank. There was... Um, uh, there was Michael Cottinger, the leader, uh, and Charlie Matthews, uh, the drummer, and then Jerry Cullen, uh, the piano player. Uh, they were all from Marymount, and Tom Dunphy's sister lived in Ferryvale, so there was a, he was over there a lot. So there was a, a big connection there, you know. And they were huge. I mean, it's very hard today, especially for young people, to, to um, envisage what they were doing. But, I mean, they regularly used to play to about 3,000 people. And that's a lot of people, and they could do that five days a week if they wanted to, you know. They often did. But the, the whole thing of showbands at Waterford was, um, it had a name. Um, there was a couple of cities. Newry had a, a name in the north as well for having good musicians. Waterford always had a great name. And the three biggest showbands were the, the Royal Showband, uh, there was the Blue Aces. Now, they were a very, very interesting band. They bucked the trend. And at the height, and while they were, they would have been a top 10 band, but at that stage they moved to England and tried to break into the, the, uh, the, the burgeoning 60s explosion in England. And they almost succeeded. Um, I mean, they, they featured on Sunday night at the London Palladium, and, and then I, I don't really know why, but for some reason or other, they made some great records. For some reason or other, they just faded away and it didn't happen for them. Then there was a Derek Joy show band. Uh, Derek was um, uh, Derek Joy was a very popular person in Waterford. I, I, I would say it wouldn't be an exaggeration to say he was a much loved person. Uh, but uh, Derek, he they were professional. But Derek had been in the Dass Factory and he just was tired of the road and he went back to the Dass Factory. And uh, incidentally, they were the first band in Ireland. They had uh, they recruited a black soul singer, a guy called Earl Jordan, uh, and he was exotic back in those days. But uh, the um, when the band broke up, uh, Derek went back to classic. But a lot of the the other lads, there was the Cattle Brothers and a few more of them, and they went to Spain. <coughs> Excuse me, they went to Spain, and they were quite successful in Spain. And then they ended up going to Mexico. And, and they were in Mexico for a good few years until they eventually disbanded. Now, then there was, um, there was a Savoy show band. Um, Savoy show band uh, had the, uh, the, the unique honour of, they were the first of any artist to have a single hit with a Bob Dylan song. Uh, Don Duggan was their singer and they recorded um, the Bob Dylan song, I'll Be Your Baby Tonight. Uh, there was the Savoy, there was the Foot Tappers, uh, there was the Decca, there was the Atlantic, there was the Seven Seas, there was a few, a few uh, quite a lot of bands. At one time, at the height of the show band era, uh, some uh, team of economists figured out that for a short period of time there was more people working in the show band industry. Now that included musicians, managers, drivers, people who worked in dance halls, everything. but there was more people working in the show band industry than there was in agriculture. That's mad, but that's, that was the way it was for a short period of time. Incredible. Yeah. And how many of those bands would have been water-based? All the bands that I'm telling you are water-based, and there was more. Um, uh, all, I suppose at the height of it, there could have been 10 bands or more working out of Waterford, you know? And um, I was into it. See, there was plenty of work because uh, the first band I was in, there was a band called the Seven Seas. They were actually based in Tremor. I was only 15 when I started playing in show bands. And um, 
we would have been, you know, no disrespect to ourselves or to my colleagues at the time, but we wouldn't have been a big band, you know. But yet, um, the Irish Independent every Sunday, or I'm sorry, every Saturday morning, they had half a page of ads. A band wanted for tomorrow night, fireys uh, in, in um, Kerry, somewhere in Cork, somewhere in, in God knows where, uh, Castle Bar in, in, in Mayo. And our manager or the band leader uh, did get the paper early. By 11 o'clock, they'd be on the, on the phone. And uh, by lunchtime, they'd be up in Castle Bar or wherever they were putting up the posters. And uh, we'd be off on the Sunday. And those kind of gigs, you'd always have three to five hundred. They were small. They were the small dance halls, you know. But you still have three to five hundred people at them, you know. So it was, uh, and people travelled. Um, people, uh, there was buses. Buses used crisscross. Um, uh, there was a, a place in Adamstown in County Wexford, and buses came from all over County Waterford, West, uh, East Cork, Tipperary. And of course, because they had to get across the river, they'd go through Waterford, you know, and and, bug, and then anybody had a car, they would think nothing of looking up and see, well, uh, they could be in Waterford, see such a band is playing in uh, Red Barn in Yall or something like that, off they go, no problem. And what, what year would we be talking about now when programs really kind of took off? Well, they, they were big, in, in, in the late 60s, they were very big. Uh, I started, I said I was only 15, so I started playing in about 63, 64, and <clears throat> they went well, the show bands were going well, and um, towards the end of the 60s started to taper off, but it was still okay into the early 70s. But then uh, what, what happened, um, and I, I was playing at the time, that's how I know, um, I, I went to England, and I was playing in England when the Dixies were a very well-known band from Cork, and... Uh, what, hap what happened with the, all the top bands, the Royal, the Miami, all of these, they were all seven or eight piece bands and they were all co-op bands. They were all lads who started off together and uh, even split with their manager. But things were going so well that what they did was they broke up and they formed two bands. Uh, say the Royal became the Royal and the Big Eight, the Miami became the Miami and the Sands, the Dixies that I was in became the Dixies and uh, Stage Two. And so... I wasn't the, the, the original uh, replacement, but I joined the Dixies uh, from London. But when I came home, the, the situation had deteriorated. And going into the early 70s, uh, ar around the Republic, there were still bands going, but it wasn't, you know. Uh, but in the north of Ireland, it was like a time warp. The north of Ireland was like uh, the heyday in, 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 in the early 60s. And that's why all the bands were, were playing there. But then when the Miami massacre happened in 75. Uh, that was um, a show band. They were, they, they were stopped by terrorists uh, and uh, they were blown up and shot and it's a terrible thing altogether. That, that was 40 years ago this year, but uh, the, um, that really finished it. That finished it. So there are bands now, a lot of the show band guys, the bigger guys play concerts or other guys out with, uh, you know. but. What I said earlier about people thinking in show bands, there were some wonderful musicians in the show bands. The older guys came from the big bands, the sit-down bands where they read music, and but they they were really good. I mean, you had, uh, uh, you had all sorts. Uh, Rory Gallagher, uh, Rory played with the Fontana show band in Cork before he went into as a kind of a blues guitarist himself. Um, Van Morrison, I can't remember who Van Morrison played, but he played with show bands. Uh, Colin Wilkinson played with the Witnesses show band, you know. And actually, Colin, people uh, don't remember this or, or might know this, but Colin really made his name in Waterford. When Colin left the Witnesses show band and he worked on his own, and he was a singer guitar player uh, uh, co uh, playing covers, but he, he had a unique voice. And, uh, you know, he used to come to work Katie Riley's Kitchen, the Ardry Hotel. And when he'd come with his guitar, usually there'd be a local band on as well. And the drummer or the bass player would stand in with him and play with him. And uh, he went then from that into musicals. And, of course, it's history after that, you know. And so prior to the arrival of the show band, what was the main outfit for entertainment? Prior to the... With, to the show band? Oh, the big dance bands. The, the big sit-down dance bands. Uh, and that's where that's how the the actual the original show band 
was a band called the Clipper Cartons from Northern Ireland. Now, this is before my time, but I, I've read up a lot about it. I've spoken to people who were there, and they were a sit-down orchestra, you know, and then they read the dots and play their arrangements. But in the middle, in those days, um, even I did it, you'd start off, you could be playing nine to one or nine to, uh, nine to two, uh, four or five hours, and you played four or five hours. But halfway through, you know, half the band would go and, uh, you know, maybe have a toilet break or have a cup of coffee or a cup of tea or something like that. And, and the Clipper Carters put on this kind of show band thing where they got up uh, off the seats and stood and, you know, acted a, around a bit, and they suddenly took off, and um, that's, where, that's where the show bands came from. And what, uh, can you tell me a little bit about the different venues in Waterford <coughs> where they would have played? Oh, yeah, the, the venues in Waterford, uh, there, was, uh, there was two dance halls. Well, going back before that, um, uh, there was dance halls that are now closed up. I don't remember them. I remember people talking about them. Um, I'm told that there was a dance hall, um, um, I can't think of the name, at the, at the cross at the corner of Patrick Street and Michael Street. It used to be Burton's, but it's a, is it A-Ware is there or something like that? There's some big, there used to be a dance hall up there, it was before my time, it was known as Buckets of Blood. <laughs> but uh, it was a tough place. But uh, there, was two, there was a dance hall in, the Arundel, in, in Arundel Square. Uh, that closed down in the 60s. But the main one was the Olympia. That's where Rapid Cabs is now. Uh, that's, and you put in two and a half, three thousand people in there. And then in Tremor, the Atlantic show band. There's a, it's, you can still see the, the, the dance floor, but it's all that uh, 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 arcade and uh, games and slots and everything there like that there, yeah. Okay. Would that be where Freddy's is now, or is it? Sorry? Is that where Freddy's is now? Or? No, below Freddy's. If you go down uh, further, uh, d uh, down towards the ocean, and you can see it's a white building, and you can uh, there's all slot machines and game and machines inside. But if you look at the floor, you can see the, the maple floor, the dance floor. That's still there, you know. But um, there was also, um, for a few years, there was uh, in Thomas Street, uh, you, uh, where Downs's pub, if you came out of Downs's pub and turned up right up to walk up towards the Glen, after a few yards you're there, um, Barker Street goes up, and on the corner there, Barker Street and Thomas Street, there was uh, the Crystal Club. It was upstairs, and uh, a, a lot of the beat groups used to play there. You know, that was uh, an interesting place as well. And what was the atmosphere like in the clubs? In the, it, well, in the, in, the, in the clubs was... Well, not the clubs, sorry, but in the, the, in the venues, sorry. Uh, yeah, in, 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 well, the, 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 the Crystal Club was usually a much younger crowd, uh, probably a heave and mass. That was probably based on the cavern in Liverpool, you know, that type of thing. The dance halls were different. The dance halls were, um, you could have anyone, uh, usually uh, girls especially, when they're about 15, their sisters used to take them off and boys, I mean, I, I used to go to dances in the Olympia, or in, yeah, in the Olympia, uh, when sure I couldn't dance, and I was even really too young to be going with girls, you know what I mean? But uh, I, I used to go, and I, <coughs> and, uh, I used to stand up near the front just to watch the bands, just to watch the musicians. There was always people did that, and sure, my mother and father, uh, you know, you wouldn't, you'd, you'd have a heart attack now to let someone else, but in those days, um, well, we never heard of drugs. Drinking wasn't cool. So the worst you'd be doing is buy 20 players and smoke cigarettes, you know. But it was, I mean, uh, at that stage, drinking wasn't cool. You know, the pubs were for old men and old women, really, you know. So what was the, the fun and the attraction of the show bands? Well, to me, it was, it was, it was um, I mean, this has been documented. Lots of people have philosophies, uh, uh, philosophers have said this is Ireland coming out of the, um, <coughs> the grey 50s and... We had our first homegrown pop stars. I mean, Elvis and, uh, and, and Cliff Richard were big, so suddenly we had Brendan Byer and Joe Dolan and Dickie Rocket. Now, we had, of course, big music stars before that. Of course we had, but these were the, the, pops, the first pop stars, really. And uh, <clears throat> it, was, it was very interesting, you know, and, and uh, the whole 60s thing was, um, was emerging. You see, what the showmans used to do, 
the, the shoal bends just replicate the top 20. And so every, uh, every Sunday, the top 20 came out and you were seeing who was number one. And you really, you had to play everything. So uh, if you look back at the charts in those days, there was all sorts of music in it, you know, and the showbans had to replicate it. And we did, and did it very well. Uh, uh, and even, like, showbands were like any other bands. There was brilliant showbands. There was some who were good, some not too good, and there were some that weren't great. But any, 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 even the worst of them could get up and play for four or five hours at a dance, you know, and make some semblance of a, of a, 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 a chance at the at the, the top ten and top twenty to do. And then there was there was a band called the Freshmen from um, Oma, I think either Oma or Nuri, I can't remember. But they specialised in Beach Boys, and they were a brilliant band. They were a seven piece band, but they could do live what the Beach Boys did in in the studio. I mean, um, some of the Beach Boys uh, back then when they were in England, they came to hear them because they were multi-track and everything, but th these guys could do it live. They, they were absolutely unbelievable. Yeah. Yeah. Incredible. Um, and can you think of any particular anecdotes or characters thinking back on... Um, thinking back on the nights you would have gone out and uh, the different events and different bands you would have gone to see, is there any particular anecdotes or any particular... Uh, uh, not, not really. W uh, uh, Waterford was, was very much... Uh, a pop and rock city. Uh, the, we we didn't get well. They, they came in time, but most of the big country bands at the time, they never really went down that well here. You know, uh, they were. <clears throat> I draw a line maybe from Kilkenny, Carlow up that way, and maybe well, they, they were big in Wexford, but Water was mainly a pop and rock venue. You know, and uh, some more maybe more or less as well, you know, so, and we had all the, um, all the big stars of the, of the, of the year, they all toured here, you know, uh, Roy Orbison, uh, uh, in, in name anyone you like, uh, and of course, uh, the, the big occasion was Val Dunican, Val Dunican was uh, from Waterford, and Val had, uh, he'd, uh, in the, to be the early 60s, yeah, he had a couple of number ones. He had a thing called Walk Tall. He had um, uh, he had um, Special Years, uh, Lucy Butterfly. He had a, a whole string of top uh, ten hits. And he was from Waterford, and he, he and he was big on television. He was the biggest name on British television for twenty years. But he came and he played in the Olympia, and um, I, I remember that day. I don't know how the. I'd say there was about 3,000 people and they were hanging out at the rafters, you know, and uh, he went on with his guitar and, and um, he, you know, but it was the fact that it was like he, he, was, he was real. He was, here was a guy from Waterford who was top of the, on top of the pops. He was a big name on television. It was like the Beatles. People talk about the Beatles. The Beatles opened up the doors for uh, a lot of people in songwriting. Uh, prior to the Beatles, most songwriters, you'd see them on the, on the films and they were all guys who lived in New York and, you know, they went out with showgirls and dance, you know, they were, and suddenly the Beatles came along and here were uh, two fellas in council houses in, in, in Liverpool who were writing these beautiful songs. So suddenly people like me and thousands of others said, well, you know, they're just like, they're just like us. And that's what, that was the whole uh, growth in songwriting. And what would, like, uh, how would your night have gone? What would be an average night out if you're going to see a band? Where would you start to? Well, uh, for me, uh, uh, I, I always went early. In, th in those days, they used to have... Um, uh, the, uh, well, as the years went by, they'd have a relief band. And there was a band here in Waterford, a family. They're still playing around uh, called the Comerford Brothers. And there was, uh, there was four or five brothers and Toots McConnell, who was... Was was the coming for? But everyone thought he was, and uh, he was their next door neighbour, and uh, they had the residency in the uh, they had the residency in the Olympia. So they used to play for the first hour. But I I liked them. So uh, 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 when I was going to dances like that, as I said, I was going to hear the music, and so I was in as soon as the doors opened, and a lot of people liked me. Uh, somebody that's what I'm saying to you. You, ha you would have young people, but you could have people in their fifties as well. Uh, you know, and maybe they might have go for a drink beforehand, but 
I, somebody came up with a statistic that between the 60s and the 70s, something like 90% of all marriages in this country uh, originated in the ballrooms, you know. And there was a, I know people find this mad now, but there was, there was a kind of a method in the madness. Um, usually the girls are on one side of the dance hall, unless uh, a boy and a girl went as a couple, you know what I mean? But usually if you went on your own, the girls are on one side, the, the lads are on the, the next side, and when they called the dance, um, you went over and asked the girl to dance. There was a big rush across the floor, and um, a dance uh, comprised of three songs, you know, uh, if it was, uh, whatever it was, it was three songs. And there was a sort of a amazing ritual that um, if, you, you, if, if you, you saw a girl and you, you thought you fancied her now, uh, and so you'd wait your chance and ask her to dance, and, you know, you'd had three dances with her, and if you wanted to go on more, you'd, uh, you'd say to her, look, well, can I have the next dance? And if she said yes, well, then you're in with half a chance, you know. But if she said no, uh, and going back to my friends, you were left down easy. There was no, uh, there was no shame in it, you know. You weren't. Uh, uh, and most girls, when you go to ask, occasionally a girl would refuse a fella to dance, but it wasn't the done thing. Usually, if um, somebody asked a girl to dance, even if she didn't like to look at him, she danced with him anyway, you know what I mean? And uh, as I said, something like 90% of all marriages originated in the ballers. It was a, it was a way of meeting uh, the opposite sex and uh, there was a structure to it, it was a safe way and you were let down easy as well, you know. Fantastic. There's famous stories about it, I don't know that they ever really happened, but fellas would tell you stories about asking a girl to dance with that. I know I'm sweating, that's my sister, you know. <laughs> I, I honestly don't know whether they really happened or not, but they were good yarns. Yeah. That's brilliant. Um, I suppose, kind of coming back to your, to your childhood in Warford, then, if, if yeah. you're happy enough to... Yeah, no problem, yeah. Um, you were born on Parliament Street. I was born on Parliament Street. Parliament Street was... Um, uh, there was a small private maternity hospital there. So I was born on Parliament Street, and um, I, I spent the first years of my life in Cheek Point, because my father was on Cheek Point. And then, I don't know what age I was about four or something like that. And we moved into town because my dad was working in town. And then uh, we eventually uh, moved to the uh, to Rockingham. It was, in, it was a corporation estate, one of the new estates that were growing up at the time. You had St. John's Park and the Cork Road, and then you had Rockingham and Fairmont. We moved to Rockingham. And um, I grew up there, a uh, very happy childhood. And when you say you grew up there, would you have been in Dwarf for the lot, or would you have been in Oh, yeah. Oh, I mean, it was, uh, but I mean, it, it was known as the village, and it, it was a separate village and a separate place, and you nailed your colours to the mast. I mean, it was, it was, I would say it was 60%, 70% uh, Kilkenny, and, and 30, 40% Waterford. So you nailed your, I mean, I have friends, uh, and one brother is Kilkenny. Uh, supporter died in the world, others Waterford, and that's just the way it is. But um, we did, we played. It was, it was an unusual place because Ferrybank, even though it's just across the river, Ferrybank was in the dice of Ossery. Uh, but um, we played all our, say, our, our um, schools hurling, uh, the city leagues, we played in Waterford, you know, so it, it was a mix of everything. Okay. Um... And so, as, as a child and a young man growing up, would yeah. you have spent most of your time in Waterford City or over in Ferryville? Oh, no. In, um, uh, we came to Waterford uh, if we had a match or uh, if we were going to the pictures or something like that, but most of the time in, in, in Ferryville. And we spent a lot of time uh, in the boat club. The boat club is gone now, but it was... Um, well, the, the, there is a boat club on, in Canada Street, but the, I mean the structure. The, the boat house has gone from Ferrybank, and uh, we spent a lot of time. And even people weren't in the boat club. Spent a lot of time on the river bank. I mean, when I was growing up, people swam every day in the river uh, off the bank in Ferrybank. Well, I can remember people swimming in the waterside, you know. And it uh, uh, was actually it was um, it was a sort of rite of passage to swim across the river uh, from Ferrybank to swim across the river. And I'm. I was then, and I still am, a very poor swimmer, you know. But you always did it on a high tide, on a still tide, 
so because if the tide is moving, it will take it down. But on a still high tide, and a couple of times I got halfway across and panicked, and I went back to the halfway. <laughs> I, I really regret that I didn't keep going and worry about getting home when it got over, you know. So I never did, and I got halfway across and went back. Can you recall any other childhood games you would have played growing up? Uh, well, uh, as I said, the ball club was uh, hurling football. Was, well, football wasn't there wasn't much football. There was soccer, mm. but not much Gaelic football. And uh, when I was growing up in Ferrybank, there was a there was a fair bit of cricket in the summer, right. a lot of cricket. Now it was it was it was making up cricket. It wasn't proper um, uh, flannels and bats and stumps, but there was bats and there was stumps made of sticks and things. But cricket was a very popular game as well. And would there be any kind of peculiar, like we had someone talking about knocks? Oh yeah, that was all over the place. Um, would there be other kind of little games like that that you wouldn't really see anymore? Uh, yeah, there was knocks. I'm not, I'm not really aware. In those days, uh, kids, they, they, they played marbles as well. But they played marbles for keeps. Like, I mean, people came in and there was a, all these uh, sort of arenas marked out and People came with bags of, of marbles and they went home with none or home with two bags, you know, and that type of thing. That doesn't happen anymore either. But not, no, not, not really. The, the one thing that we did, um, we were all music mad. And, and um, in those days, um, there was only Radio Luxembourg. Radio Aaron played little or nothing, you know, especially a lot at night. But um, Radio Luxembourg only came in at night and um, <clears throat> didn't come in during the day, but we, we found that at the telegraph poles, and, that, and at that time too, the transistors uh, radio started to come in as well, you know what I mean? And to buy one of those was a big thing. But we used uh, hammer nails in the uh, telegraph poles and hoist up the transistor, and the telegraph pole became the aerial, and you'd get a much better uh, signal. So uh, we used... Hours into the night, just listen to Radio Luxembourg, yeah. Is that with the street listening? Like? Yeah, right. yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh. Um, I know you said you're kind of coming up uh, through very Bank, but uh, would it be in, thinking of Waterford City, would it be any of the particular shops or employers uh, that you can recall that wouldn't be there now, or any particular noteworthy ones that you can think of? Oh, would, yeah. uh, there was lots of... Um, uh, if you come up... Uh, if you come up the quay, sure, there was uh, where where the Granville is now, and uh, where the expanded Granville. The Granville was always there, but uh, where uh, George's Court is, that was Herndon Company. That was a huge, big uh, department store. Um, then there was lots of smaller. There were there was lots of. I'll tell you what was um, what are gone. There was uh, lots of small pubs, and what happened was that uh, in those days, a lot of the smaller pubs, they weren't really viable, you know. A lot, a lot of them were privately owned and people went in. But um, the Water and Vintners, uh, they, had a, they formed a, a committee, and which was actually uh, very clever and very advanced at the time, and they created a fund. And uh, when a lot of these small pubs came in, they bought them and extinguished the licence. They extinguished the license, and uh, that, uh, that was it. Because in those days, uh, I'm not sure what the, the, the procedure is now, but up to relatively recently, uh, to open a pub, you had to buy existing licenses. And uh, you know, there was, I remember one time uh, some years ago, I spent an awful long time doing it, and I traced the licenses in a lot of the pubs. You know, and uh, it was fascinating where they went. Um, I know. In, in the Rundon Square, there was a, a very famous pub, um, Elwards, uh, in the Rundon Square, a big pub there. And that licence, that only closed down, I think, in the 80s. And that licence went into the off licence in Dunn Stores. Uh, I think the licence from the old Adelphi Hotel, I, as a matter of fact, I know it did, I went out to the Park Inn. Uh, so, you know, the, you had to t t change the licences around, you know, and chase them around. Well, they were in those days. Uh, licenses worth a lot of money, and but it's uh, you know whoever thought that uh, pubs are now, you know pubs are different. Uh, very hard to make money in a pub now, you know, and it's uh, the time has changed, habits have changed, uh, uh, 
drink was some, uh, one time a pint, maybe it was something you, you, you bought with a small change in your pocket. Now, now it's a, a purchase. And uh, as well as that, uh, people could drive with one, two pints, maybe even three, and still be under the limit. And, you know, they, so you had this thing where people went for a drink on home from work or <clears throat> um, you had people, no matter where they lived, you could be living in... Lismore Park and drink at Ballybricken or live in Ballybricken and drink in Katie O'Reilly's because yeah, you could drive and have two points and meet your friends and drive home, but you can't do that now at all. And that's that's why you look at all the pubs that are closed around, uh, you know, it's apart from the price of drink, uh, it's, it's just, uh, you just can't can't drink now at all. I'm not saying it's a bad thing. Um, there's a big problem in rural areas because the pub, for especially for people living on their own, that's their only way of meeting people and they'd go down at night and play a game of cards, have a couple of pints and go home. And they never, I don't think they ever bothered anyone, but now they can't. And so you have a lot of old people drinking on their own at home. And of course, when you drink on your own at home, you drink more than you would drink in the pub. So there's, there's a social problem to that as well, you know. Um, can you remember any of the old characters that would have been around Waterford? Yeah, there, there were. Um, uh, there was uh, there was loads of them Ballybricken. Uh, I mean, Ballybricken was a no a notorious for the cast. But wh what I remember that there was um, what would you call them? Kind of semi homeless men or something. Knights of the road. You you wouldn't call them a tramp. You know what I mean? But there was great respect for them. There was there was um, there's a, there was a lovely man. Uh, I think he was a Mr. Power. There's lots of photographs of him. He was known as the Birdman. A small little man wore a big overcoat and cap, and his pockets were full of grain. And he used to put out for the birds. The birds used to follow him everywhere, you know. Uh, there was a guy called Walter Huey, or Hewitt. He was, um, uh, you know, he was, uh, as they say, a marker to the drink. And, uh, but he was a member of an extremely educated, well-spoken man. Uh, he was a member, there was a, there's a, there was a family in Dublin called Hewitt. They had Hewitt Motors. They were really big motor dealers. And, but Walter was sort of the black sheep in the family, and he lived in Waterford, but he could be lying in the middle of the street, holding up traffic, you know, drunk and everything. But, um, uh, but when you get talking to an extremely clever and well-educated and spoken man, you know, that's, that's the thing with people uh, on the road, you know, you never, um, you never know what their background is. I'm, not, I'm sure people still do it, but I know when I was young, uh, you were always told, you know, show respect uh, for... Anybody, we used to call them tramps, which is probably an offensive name, but you know, but uh, yeah, but they, they always got respect, you know, always got respect. Okay, um, that's covered actually all across the list very well. Um, I suppose, just as, just as a final thing, is there any other kind of curious um, facets of Waterford City that would have existed that don't anymore, uh, either in terms of building or people or any like particular? Well, I suppose one of the uh, the main differences for me growing up uh, uh, and now, I mean, I worked most of my life in the Monster Express uh, when I did leave it for a while and came back and I worked in music, but um, was the power of the local newspapers. <clears throat> Very difficult for people now uh, to, uh, with Facebook and the social media and everything and anything, you know, but... Uh, uh, but when I was growing up, the, the newspapers were all powerful. I mean, I can remember uh, every September when the regional college, uh, you know, coming into the, when the regional college would restart for the academic year, and uh, there'd be a queue from uh, the Munster Express almost down to the, maybe a hundred yards down the quay. Uh, people waiting to get the first paper so they could see what flats were available, what accommodation was available. Uh, the same with news. Uh, we used to have um, uh, we we used to come out on a Wednesday, and uh, and we had an edition on a Friday because if any big story happened, and if there was a theatre thing, you know, I, I, all the opera festivals, they they'd all wait and they'd be eagerly waiting to get the paper out to see the read the reviews and things like that. But that's all changed now. The newspapers are still going strong, and they've they've changed uh, their tack and uh, their 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 looking after the readers in a different way, but it, it, they were all powerful. That's, I mean, there was no WLR, there was no Beat FM, you know, there was uh, 
RT rarely did any, very little in the provinces, so is, uh, the newspapers were king. Oh, well, thank you very much for talking to us. Tom. You're welcome. Thank you. Anything else you want to dwell on, or his hand? Um, no, that's actually covered everything really well uh, between the conversation and everything else that actually went down to the list. Yeah, Where could right. I go? We went to look down, I was like, oh, I know, we've done all that. Yeah, yeah. Brilliant. I'm trying to think, is there anything... Uh, um, so a lot of what we're trying to catch with it is like the colour of the old city. And let, let her roll again for a minute. Yeah. Let her roll again for a minute. Yeah, um, one of one of the things that happened when, when uh, again in my teens was transport. Um, as as I said to you, we swam in the river, uh, and so the, but Tremor, uh, there was um, when I was small, the Tremor train was there, okay, but then there was buses, but it was a big deal uh, to get to Tremor, you know, and uh, when you get back to the station or the bus, you'd have to walk home. But then in the mid-60s, the Honda 50 came out. And the Honda 50 uh, uh, changed Ireland. It was unbelievable. It was a cheap little motorbike. Uh, or, uh, and the scooters, the Lambrettas came out as well. And any, nearly anybody but could afford one. And it changed Ireland. Say, for instance, um, people, men working, who were living in Kilmac Thomas and living up in Ballylanine or wherever they were living. And t for them to get to work, terrible. But now they have this little bike and off they go and they take them and they go work at Waterford City in a factory. They could work on a building site, wherever it was. And the same for us when, uh, uh, if you, even if you're an apprentice, you, you'd manage a little Honda 50 or, or a, something, a little scooter or something like that. And suddenly you come home from work or whatever it was in the evening and uh, high tide in Woodstown. And he could go to Woodstone. It transformed, opened up everything. Cheap transport like that. Uh, and uh, uh, as I said, the Honda. I remember my dad telling me, my father was a fisherman, and uh, uh, in, in conjunction with the, the, the little small outboard engines came as well. And suddenly, guys, uh, they, could say, they could get into their punts and uh, go 10 miles up the river. Uh, rather than having to row back brake and all the way up, and so the, the transport changed in the cities. That was that was one of the biggest um, uh, game changers in in society. Uh, I'd say from the mid sixties on, and I'd say the little Honda Fifty was the was the king. Uh, Christy Moore actually in the last year or two he he recorded a song. Uh, a tribute to the Honda 50. It's very, it's very funny as well, you know. But it was big, big game changer. Brilliant. We only saw there the other day coming up Georgia Street, the vintage shop they have uh, on the 50, the window display. Yeah, yeah. but cool. it was. I mean, I, I had, I, I, I had a motorbike. I had a slightly bigger one, but I couldn't. Believe when I was going to college in Cork, I just it meant I could stay home on a Sunday night, or, or uh, yeah, on a Sunday night, and I used to get up at uh, six o'clock on a Monday morning. Off I went up to Cork on my little bike, you know, and when I'd be finished on a Friday, I could come home, you know, and uh, they were, um, but as I said, for people working, uh, especially men working up on the buildings, they're living out of miles in all the vill outlying villages, um, instead of having to cycle halfway and look for it, off, became independent. Okay. Right, now I can't think, I'm trying to think of any, anything else that's... Uh, that was a big game change at the time. Was it really? No. Oh, yeah. But, um, probably in the 60s, uh, the social classes broke down as well and merged. And I think uh, in Waterford, uh, Waterford was always a very eclectic city. You know, it was we had... I suppose we had our, our, our aristocrats. We aristocrats. We had everything, but there was never. I don't know. Maybe people disagree with me, but I think water compared to the likes of Limerick and Cork, there wasn't that snobbery. Uh, that, that you know, there was more of a mix. And what happened, of course, uh, in Waterford when Water Crystal uh, uh, and its heyday. You know, fifteen hundred people working there, earning um, more money than most professionals, and suddenly you had. Uh, well, there were craftspeople, but there were still factory workers, and suddenly they were 
they were taken over in the golf clubs and uh, all the other clubs that were sort of, you know, exclusively uh, to the professions before that. So there was a, 60s was a huge era for change, a huge era for change. It was, uh, people's uh, attitudes changed, uh, their working lives changed, transport, everything changed. It was a huge, huge era for change. Rounding up there, before you're saying like the Honda 50 was a big um, turning point. Before that, when people just relied on the buses, or what was the transport network? Yeah, the, the, there was there was the buses, and um, it wasn't a great um, wasn't a great uh, service. You know, uh, I remember we had um, my dad had a cousin living in Kilmeaden, and we used to go visit them a couple of times a year, and it was a big big deal. You'd be preparing for it all week, and we'd get the cork bus. And you sleep us off near the creamy in Kilmeaden. And then we'd walk maybe two miles to where they lived. And on the way back then, you'd uh, walk the two miles back and we'd wait for the bus coming from Cork uh, 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 to, to get home. And then, when, of course, when we get home, the bus used to drop. They dropped everyone at the, the bus station on the quay and you'd have to walk to Ferrybank. It was uh, even going to school. I, I, I When I went to secondary school, uh, I cycled to school or got on Kennedy's bus, ran, but you could never depend on it in terms of time for five or ten minutes, you know. Uh, it always ran reasonably on time, but if you had a class at two o'clock and uh, if the bus arrived at five past two, uh, you were in trouble. So we cycled, uh, you know, and that's our walk. And that, that's, um, but Kennedy's bus was there, and in those days, of course, there was. Um, there was capital punishment, and uh, you know you, you'd get the leather or the cane if you were caught late going into into class. And where where was it? You were schooled? I, I started off in uh, I started off in Waterpark, and then when we moved to Ferrybank, I went to the national the boys national school of Ferrybank, and then in secondary school because all most of my friends were going to De La Salle, I went to De La Salle as well. Yeah. That's brilliant, John. Thank you very much. Okay, you're welcome.